tired of traditional talk? People pontificating about this or that, the left or the right. Sometimes the truth is just all lost in the noise. Having learned life lessons the hard way, Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. So tune in, turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Now, here's your host, Chuck Gallagher. And this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio, and it is, it's is—it's always an honor to be with you guys and to have an opportunity to carry on some really interesting conversations. I think most of you that listen to the show on a regular basis know that uh, years back, and I, when I say years, you can kind of see from the gray hair. Well, if you're listening, you don't see the gray hair, but if you're seeing it on YouTube, you certainly would. But from the gray hair uh, years ago, I was uh, involved in the financial services arena. I was a CPA tax partner in a firm, firm and, and things were simpler then. It was, um, it was an easier environment. I guess I came in kind of after the Carter years. And uh, so I remember when interest rates were incredibly high. Um, in fact, I, I'll never forget, I think it was in 1980, uh, my father-in-law died and, and my mother inherited a small amount of money. It was truly small, but, um, but she went to the uh, savings and loan when they had those back then and put it in a CD that got her 12% interest per year for five years. And that was normal. And the interest rate on a house was about 21% and very few people could actually afford it. And then, of course, we came along to the Reagan years, and things got, I guess, a little bit better financially, although in the 80s and at various times, we all have those fluctuations. So if you're young and you're listening to this, you're like, I don't know what this guy's talking about. I mean, I don't remember Carter or Reagan or any of those people, and you've just lived through the Great Recession of 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, whatever years we want to call that, and yes, it was bad. But those of us that have a few years under our belts understand that everything, like the ocean, the, the, the ocean comes in, the tide comes in, and the tide goes out, and there are good times and bad times, bull markets and bear markets. And the question is, what are we learning from the experience? And today, we're going to talk financial stuff. And I'm excited about this because this is kind of like in my wheelhouse. My guest is Joel Block. He is the chief deal maker for Bullseye Capital. And I kind of like that chief deal maker. Uh, he is the CEO of a real estate hedge fund. They acquire distressed assets nationwide. He's been involved in over 40 syndicated transactions through his career. And um, he formed in 2012 a team to launch what's referred to or called Bullseye Capital Real Property Opportunity Fund, which really deals with real estate. But, but beyond real estate, uh, Joel's a financial expert. He really understands markets and things and how stuff works. And, and I think the greatest value on this show is talking a little bit about how does it work? You know, we've got people listening literally from coast to coast, and everybody wants to improve their financial standing. And we come up with ideas, and we've heard of ideas, but but how does it really work, and what can we do? So, Joel, I am thrilled to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, man, thank you for having me. Nice to be here. And, and, and dude, i got to tell you, on the front end, what a radio voice. I love it. God, really? I love it. <laughs> all right, well, listen, maybe we'll let me we'll do this together a little more often. <laughs> That'll be all right. No, I, had, I had no idea, by the way, you were a CPA. Yep. Uh, well, we'll put it this way, former CPA. Uh, those yeah. that listen to the show know that, yes, I was a CPA, and, and I screwed that career up royally, which uh, uh, gave me a little diversion to federal prison. Uh, not something I'm proud of, but something that has uh, changed my life forever and gives me the unique opportunity today to talk to people about choices and consequences because every choice we make has a consequence. And, and I think one of the things, Joel, to start this off is, um, and I'm, this is kind of a blunt thing to say, and it's a little odd beginning perhaps for you on a radio show, but I know from my end that the one thing that was easy to do was sell a fraud. 
Now, what I mean by that was, and again, not proud of the past, but I did create a Ponzi scheme before I knew what a Ponzi scheme was. And there are certain things that uh, make it easy to do. And I call it the pit. There's a promise. People are looking for something extraordinary, some way to invest their money, something that's going to give them better than what the average person gets. Um, the I part of it becomes an illusion. Now, in a real asset transaction, there isn't an illusion. But if it's a fraud, there's an illusion. Bernie Madoff created an illusion. He created fake documentation to support the idea that what he was doing was real. And lastly, there's trust. And when I say trust, trust from the perspective that the closer you are to people and the more they feel that this promise and illusion works and you can embrace the trust, the easier it is to get people to invest. And, and so I say that as a little odd beginning because in the world you're in, you're actually... Uh, through the creation of Bullseye Capital Real Property Opportunity Fund, you have created a, a, a real uh, hedge fund or, uh, or asset fund to invest in real properties nationwide that you feel and your partners feel are going to produce a profit. So, so tell us a little bit about how that part of it works and how you find people that are interested in doing that. Well, first, let, let me, uh, I, I don't personally have any experience uh, like you just described. Uh, I, I've that's, never, a, that's a good thing. <laughs> that's good. I've, never, uh, I've never been the subject of any kind of a regulatory inquiry. I've never even had a shareholder lawsuit in 25 years. So, I mean, I've, I've always, uh, you know, been pretty straight. So to be very crystal clear about that. Right. Uh, you're the good guy. I get that. Well, you know, listen, I think 98% or 99% are good. I, I think there's a couple guys that, uh, get a little out of control. They don't thoroughly understand the rules. There's not a lot of supervision. Uh, you know, it's I operate in an un unregulated area, which makes it uh, probably a little easier to do uh, some things that are uh, bad. And you know, I teach a uh, course twice a year to CPAs, attorneys, investment bankers, and others about how to set up these kind of organizations. And there's a piece in the middle of the program, and I say if you're somebody that has a hard time uh, keeping your hand out of the cookie jar, this is probably not a good business for you. Because, right. it's, uh, you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, for guys that don't have any self-control, this could be a really a problematic uh, area. Um, but people are gullible. You know, people, you know, the trust and gullibility kind of go hand in hand. You know, when, when I think of Ponzi scheme, uh, I think about people being gullible. And uh, I do some expert witness work. Attorneys call me regularly and they ask me, hey, listen, I got a client that uh, was ripped off by somebody who had this problem. And I'm it's always about securities matters, you know, things where they invested money. Uh, you know, 50,000 or 100,000 or 500,000. I'm actually in the middle of something right now that uh, is in uh, the, the high, uh, you know, near 100 million. And, you know, somebody did something to somebody they shouldn't have done. And, you know, what, what's my opinion? How does it work? And their Ponzi schemes never are on purpose. Uh, I can't say never, but they usually are not on purpose. They're, they're usually accidental. And they happen in a lot of different ways. And, and I, I counsel people who take my class on uh, you know, what not to do to prevent that from happening. So just to be crystal clear, really important, um, if you're going to be in this business for any period of time, you really have to be uh, be really good and clean. Back to the first thing that you said, you know, you're talking about markets and how, uh, you know, I got started in the, uh, the mid-80s. I, I came out of uh, school in 1984. I started at Price Waterhouse, the CPA firm. I'm also a CPA. I'm still licensed, um, although I haven't done accounting work in 25 or more years. But... Uh, I was doing tax work at Price Waterhouse uh, for a giant real estate syndicator, and I didn't even know what that was at that time. But uh, but I just loved reading the partnership agreements. I hated doing the tax work, but I loved reading the partnership agreements. And I said, "This is the business for me. I want to be in this. This is a deal making business, and there's a lot of money to be made, and it just sounded great." And so I left uh, Price Waterhouse. And by the way, I was terrible at doing uh, taxes and accounting. And if I didn't quit, I'd been fired for sure. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll tell you, I was terrible at accounting, good at taxes. And by the way, we've got about a minute to wrap this portion up. But but let's go back to where you were with uh, Price Waterhouse and the real estate. So let me just tell you that uh, when you talk about good markets and bad markets, I'll tell you that in good markets, when the tide is in, everybody wins. Everybody makes money in a good market. In a bad market, and I would say that we've just come out of a bad market, we're still in a mediocre and not so good market. 
uh, only professionals make money. Almost everybody else loses. And that's, uh, you got to really remember that that might be some of the most significant investment advice anybody ever gives you. I, I will promise you one thing. I will tell you the truth. And the truth is that in good times we all make and in bad times only pros make. And you can try, try, try. Uh, and, and maybe through this interview, I'll explain some of the reasons uh, why uh, mere mortals don't make money and professional investors do. You know, Joel, I think uh, as we wrap up this first segment, and it goes so quick, I think that that is a great starting point for our next segment because, you know, the reality of it is, uh, you're right, in a good market, when everything is going right, of course people are going to be okay. But fundamentally, if I'm a betting man, and I don't really bet, the markets aren't rigged for the common guy. So this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And what we're going to do is when we come back from our break, we're going to talk with Joel Block, who is the chief deal maker of Bullseye Capital. And we're going to talk about the markets and how that really plays into what the average person can do who wants to invest and wants to protect themselves. We'll be back in just a minute. And we're back with Straight Talk Radio. This is Chuck Gallagher, and it's always a pleasure to be able to talk about something that's a whole lot of fun and and important for the people who are listening, because in reality, all of us want to make sure that we're financially stable, that we're prepared for retirement, that we're doing the best we can with the assets that we have. My guest is Joel Block. He is the chief deal maker of Bullseye Capital, uh, and he really understands these markets. And Joel, we finished the last segment with you saying when the tide's in, when everything's going great, everybody wins. But when it's a bad market, only the professionals win. What do people do who want to protect themselves and how do they time those things or do they? Well, listen, the one thing I, I tell this uh, to my wife and my kids is that the one thing that none of us can control is timing. You know, we might know something's going to happen. But we don't know when. And, and that's one of the things that is very significant. You know, I can't really tell people what to do with their money that's going to make it work for them. That's, that's uh, what financial advisors do and other people. Uh, but what I can tell you is the difference between retail investors and professional investors. Okay. And this is, it's really important. And I, I hope that if people understand, because, you know, 99.9% .9 of people are certainly their, uh, their retail investors. They're just regular people that... Uh, they don't do this for a living. They, they do whatever their job is all day long. They accumulate some money. They want to put it somewhere that uh, works for them. Those are retail investors. Uh, they pay uh, retail commissions. And it doesn't matter if you're paying discounts at Schwab. You're still a retail investor. You're not buying wholesale. You're not on uh, Wall Street. The biggest difference between what we do and what uh, retail investors do is that we pretty much know in advance what's going to happen before it happens. Retail investors, they guess, they hope, they wish, they think, they might. You know, we understand the markets, we understand the neighborhoods. And, and again, I'm talking about real estate because real estate is something that's a little different than the stock market. Uh, but we understand markets, we understand neighborhoods, we understand, uh, you know, a lot of things that other people don't have, uh, you know, access to. It's not that they can't access it if they wanted to. It's that they don't and they don't recognize the importance of doing that. So, you know, we'll buy a house and we'll have it sold before we ever pay for it. And that's a guaranteed deal because it's sold before we get now i'm not saying that that's a ponzi because it's not the the steps are that we get a buyer and then we close on the trends again we lock something up we get a buyer we close on it and then we do the second sale so uh, at no time are we ever selling something that we don't own right but we go and we find the person that we want to buy the house that we've just uh, locked up before that ever happens so we know uh with 99% certainty what's going to happen before it ever does. Uh, and it takes a lot of skill to do that. You don't uh, get out of bed in the morning and just say, I'm going to try and see how this goes. Uh, you know, that's one of the things that a lot of people don't recognize. Um, I, you know, I sometimes I kid around with doctors. Uh, you know, they're very intelligent people. They're highly educated people. Uh, but sometimes they don't uh, give credit to other people for having lots of skills. And everything, listen, uh, carpenters, uh, you know, may not be a university skill, but let me promise you, those people are highly skilled people. Uh, right. There's all kinds of skills in our world that are very hard. I can't do any of those things. I do what I do very well. I can't do any of those things. And, uh, you know, so I sometimes kid around that, uh, you know, none of us wake up in the morning and say, you know what, I think I'm going to go do a brain surgery today. You'll see how it goes. But yet, right. you know, other people, doctors and others will 
say, well, you know, listen, I'm going to flip a house. How hard could it be? Well, let me promise you, it, it is hard. And it's not hard to do it wrong. It's not hard to make no money, but it's really hard uh, to consistently make a lot of money. So, Joel, let me ask you a question, okay? I, I, and I'm going to be the retail guy, okay? So I want to flip a house, hypothetically. So what I do is I'm going to go out and I'm going to start scouring the market. Well, one, I need to find a house that is... Um, a good asset purchase, perhaps undervalued, but yet sellable. But my perspective would be, if I'm going out and looking, you'll have already found that house before I even have a sniff that it's a possibility. And then when I do find something, I'm spending time trying to fix it up, and perhaps I'm putting more into it than is required to be able to turn around and sell it. And third, I've got to find a buyer, but I'm not in the buyer finding business, which means I'm probably finding a realtor who's 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 making money on the purchase and the sale, but I'm the one at risk. So how how do you do that? How do you do this when the person flipping it, I think I just described? Well, listen, and those three things that you said are all 100% right, and there's about 10 more that we can Okay. Go. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of more reasons. Um, one of the first things that a retail person who wants to try to be involved in real estate needs to do, and this is not a real estate conversation per se, it's really more of an investing conversation. Right. The first thing you got to understand is who's on your side and who's in your pocket. You know, realtors are not really on your side. They're not on the seller side. They're not on the buyer side. They're on the deal side. They're rooting for the deal to happen because when the deal happens, they get paid. That's how it works. And so, uh, number one, you're paying, uh, you know, lots of fees. Now, we do pay brokerages, by the way. Brokers provide a very important function, and they do know a lot of things, but uh, it eats into your profits. Now, uh, 3% or 6% may not sound like a lot, but they get paid on the whole amount. And think about this. If you've got a 75% mortgage and 25% cash, which is kind of normal, 6% is really 25% of all the equity in the whole deal. So. Wow. Okay. If you think about it from that perspective, you get what I'm saying, right? Right, absolutely. If you stop and think about you know, what they're getting, uh, it's a lot. And, and I'm not saying that they don't deserve it, and I'm not saying uh, anything about realtors because we deal with them, and I'm licensed in California myself, although I don't take listings and I don't uh, you know, do those kind of representations. But uh, you, know, you have to think who's in your pocket, even the attorneys. You know, the, do the attorneys entirely help you the way you want them to help you, even CPAs. I mean, everybody's got an agenda. And part of the thing that's very difficult if you don't do this all day long is understanding who's got what agenda, what is that agenda, how are they going to help me, you know, where is it? And it's very, very difficult for retail consumers to figure these things out. It's just, um, it's terribly difficult. And uh, I don't have a good solution, you know. But what I do tell people is that most activities are a team sport you're going to do a lot better working with other people. Now, there's different ways to form teams. You could have somebody who's really good at looking for properties on your team, somebody who's better at selling properties on your team. You could have a contractor who's really good at fixing stuff on your team. So you got you know different people that you know could uh, participate. Um, you got to make sure, though, that everybody's on the same side of the table. And here's what that means. If you hire a contractor and the contractor is going to get $20,000 for doing a whole bunch of work, uh, and then he says, well, gee, there's some other things, and now he's up to 30000 Does he get paid for showing up and doing the work, or does he participate in the profits so that he's smart about how he uh, does whatever it is that he's supposed to do? And it's really a big problem. You know, somebody might say, well, gee, you know, we should decorate the bathrooms, and we should redecorate the bedrooms, and we should redecorate all the other things and do all these different things. And, you know, some things yield profit, some things do not. Um, I will tell you, that we don't hardly ever renovate anything. We buy at deep discounts and then we resell to somebody else who wants to uh, do the, uh, the rehab. Because rehab, there, there's a lot of risk in a rehab. Uh, there's just, it takes uh, more capital, it takes a long time. Uh, you're subject to all kinds of uh, possible zoning issues and there's a lot of issues involved in, in doing a rehab. And so we really don't do it unless it's on an apartment building or something larger. If it's on a small home, we won't even do it. I mean, we just we do what's called wholesaling, which is uh, we'll buy the property uh, one day and we'll sell it another day. We have a whole group. It's called arbitrage. We buy one day and we sell the next day. And we have a whole engine that does that. 
Now, and, I have to assume from what you're saying, Joel, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I have to assume from what you're saying, that goes back to the comment you just made, which is you need a team. Because fundamentally, if I'm hearing this kind of right, if I was the investor, then really what I'm looking to do is take my capital and, and put it to some financial use. I want to take my $25,000, leverage it with the $75,000, buy the $100,000 house, turn around and sell it for $120,000, and you've got a team I'm gathering put together that finds the house and finds the buyer so that that $20,000 profit can be generated in my hypothetical example. Yeah, but let me, let me, uh, let me go on. There's a few more things, you know. One of the things people never think about, so you buy a house for 100, you put uh, 20 in it, now it's worth uh, 130 or whatever the number is, or 140, you pay your realtors another 10, and you made uh, you know five or 10,000 yourself, whatever it is, and plus there was probably a cost of capital. You gotta factor in everything. Cost of capital, how much, you know, how much time did you invest in the deal, how hard did you work on it? And the reason that that's important is because you know if, if your goal is to give yourself a job, that's fine, no problem, no hard feelings about that. But a lot of times when you take a step back, uh, what you find out is that all you've done is give yourself a job and you're making 10 or $20 an hour. And if that's what you want, then that's great. But a lot of people are disappointed to find out that they're not really making that much money on a time basis. If they think about how much time. So the question you have to ask up front is, do I want to be an active investor or do I just want to put the money to work? Are you looking for a job to keep you busy? Or do you want the money to maximize its opportunity? And if the money, if the goal is for the money to work, then you might want to consider being a passive investor in something like what we do, where we just do the work and you know we get uh, forty percent of the profit, and you get sixty percent of the profit. And they get certain advances uh, up front, but uh, you know you got to think: is that the way I want to go, or do I really want to do the work? And 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 there's a, there's reasons that you might be on either side of the coin. You know, it, some people are right for us, and other people are not right for us. And we tend to work with people that are a little more well healed anyway. I mean, just right. in general, those opportunities are, are really for a, a certain sector of the economy. And that's not uh, because I set the rules. That's because how the government sets up the rules. You know, they that, don't want everybody doing that. So since we're coming up on a break, let's do this. Obviously, one of the things, and I think that is really critical, is, you know, am I an active investor? Do I really want to do this stuff? Or do I want to put my money to work? And I think that's a, a, a great question and something that when we come back, we can talk about. So for those people, I'm going to use your doctor example. For those doctors that say, well, you know, I have capital and I want to put it to work. How do we make that part of it happen? And what are opportunities that make sense outside of being the retail person that thinks they're going to be the brilliant stock trader? This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. My guest is Joel Block. He is the chief deal maker for Bullseye Capital. And Joel, it's been a great conversation thus far. Those of you that are listening, hang with us. We'll be back in just a moment. And this is Chuck Gallagher. We're back on Straight Talk Radio, and my guest is Joel Block, the chief deal maker for Bullseye Capital. And Joel, when we finished the last segment, <laughs> I thought it was kind of interesting. One of the things you, you end these things really nicely. One of the things you were talking about is, okay, so I've got capital. Do I want a job? Do I want to physically get involved in doing this stuff, or do I want a return? And and my guess is that probably somewhat separates, I'll call it the men from the boys or the professionals from the amateurs. So, so give me a perspective of those two things. Well, um, listen, number one, uh, you have to decide, do you want to put your money to work or do you want to work? Uh, you know, I know a lot of our clients are doctors and, uh, you know, I respect them greatly, not only for the great work that they do, uh, but because the ones that we deal with, they, we, we have a, a great relationship, all of us together. And we deal with athletes, celebrities, all kinds of people. And what they recognize is that their highest earning power is doing whatever they're trained to do. You know, if a doctor is making four or 600,000 a year, whatever it is. But a lot of those guys are in surgery right this minute being mad that they're not, uh, that their money's not working as hard as they are. And that's a frustrating right. thing to a lot of those guys. And so if the doctor starts thinking about buying a house and rehabbing it, and he starts thinking about his hourly wage based on how much money he makes. You know, real estate doesn't yield that much money most of the time. If you start doing fixer uppers and flippers now, if you don't have a job and, and this is kind of you're going to create yourself a little business, this is a pretty good one. It, it is a pretty good business. Uh, but if you don't have a stash of capital and you don't have a better alternative, 
that's one of the ways you might think about what to do with yourself. So, uh, but I would tell you that for people who decide to be active in real estate, there are some important things that you need to know. And, okay. uh, you know, there are some hard truths, um, if you don't mind me being very forward. about. No, that's ab- absolutely. That's what Straight Talk Radio is about, buddy. You know, you're, um, well, I guess I'll give you some straight talk then. How about that? You know? Great. Uh, you know, you, uh, you you talk about ethics and, and other kinds of things, uh, keeping people on the straight and narrow. Uh, all investing, all investing. Uh, in fact, almost everything. It's not just investing. It's almost everything is rigged. It's rigged for somebody and not for somebody else. And, you know, if you look at politics, I mean, all these things, they're all set up to favor some side or another. So let me tell you how these things are rigged. And when I say rigged, I don't mean illegal. I just mean that you don't really have a chance. And I'm going to tell you why. Uh, You started to mention some of the things uh, very early uh, when we started talking. But let me give you a few more things. And and this is a great example. Um, I was on an airplane uh, some time ago, and I'm talking to some guy, and he says, what are you doing? I said, I'm in the real estate business. He says, uh, you know, I tell him I run a fund, and we buy distressed assets all over the country. We've got a team. We're out there doing this and that. And he says, yeah, I'm looking to buy an apartment building myself. I said, I said, really, that's fantastic. I said, if uh, if a real estate broker, uh, you know, got a call from one of his clients and the guy said, look, I'm, I'm in terrible distress. Uh, you know, my uh, business partner's cheating me. My wife is leaving me and the uh, government is chasing me for some uh, money. They're going to put a lien on my property any day now. Uh, so I got this property over here at, uh, you know, first and Main Street. It's worth a million bucks. But if you can find me a buyer by Friday, I'll take uh, 600000 in cash because uh, otherwise the government's going to put a lien on it. I asked the guy in the airplane, who's the real estate broker going to call? Is he going to call you or is he going to call me? And the guy got really mad. I mean, he got uh-huh. really, really upset. Like, uh, you know, what do you think? Uh, just because you run a fund, my money's not as green as yours? And I said, you know what? I said, your money's not as green. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'll tell you this. You know, and this everybody needs to put themselves into the shoes of the guy in the airplane. And you'll understand all of these things. I said, number one, who's been feeding deals to that broker all year long? The doctor or the guy on the airplane or me, probably right, somebody right. like me. Right, and so right. we, the way it works in the United States and all around the world is that people trade favors. They, uh, you know, hey, listen, you were nice to me. I'll be nice back to you. So that's number one. Number two, brokers are in it for the commission. They're not in it for fun and games. Who's more likely to close? OK, well, I may or may not buy the property, but I can give the guy a yes or a no in 30 minutes. You know, uh, my money's all in cash. It's sitting, ready to go. That guy's money's probably in a stockbroker house. He's got to sell some stocks. He's not ready. Maybe he only has 200000 out of the 600000 that he needs. He's probably got to go borrow some money. That money's not going to be ready immediately. So the truth is the guy's not really organized to take advantage of an opportunity like that. You know, here's another couple things. Uh, the broker calls and says, okay, we're going to be having a due diligence meeting at the property. So you do your inspection of the property uh, on Thursday at uh, 2 o'clock. The doctor says, no, listen, I'm sorry, I can't be at the property uh, Thursday at 2 o'clock. I have surgery. How about a week from Friday at 4 o'clock? Well, the, the, the deal is going to be gone by then. You know, I can have I can have five people in any city uh, tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock in the morning if I need to. You know what I mean? I mean, we're organized for this to happen. Retail people are not organized for it. Retail that makes people, sense. You get what I'm saying? Absolutely. And then there's always a little bit of Hey, listen, uh, I'm going to give you this special deal. But, you know, you got this one friend I've been wanting to meet. Can you arrange dinner for all three of us? You know, there's just there's all these kinds of things. None of them are improper. Uh, none of them are illegal. None of them are doing, we're not doing anything that's wrong. It's just I circulate in a network of people who know more stuff than other people do. And not, for my particular area, you know, I, I don't circulate, uh, you know, in, uh, in other areas. I, you know, it always amazes me. Uh, we have friends that are firemen and uh, they seem to have great camaraderie. You know, one guy needs to build a brick patio, and so all the guys come out this Saturday, and then the next guy needs to build a uh, kind of a deck the next week, and all the guys go to that guy's house. And so they all help each other, and they end up with really nice stuff at their houses, and I have to go pay retail because I don't have any friends to do that sort of thing. And so we all have our advantages. You know, we all right. have something going for us. And, you know, you got to recognize, you know, what is real for you. And people who are more realistic are more successful. People who are less realistic and hope, wish, think, guess, you know, all the things that I said that retail investors do, those people are less successful. And, and then they turn around, they, they don't understand why. Well, I'm telling you why. It's because of all these reasons. 
that, you know, we bet on sure things and we don't hope and guess, you know, we strategize, we plan, we organize, we have teams of people, we're organized to, to do everything we need to do. And it's all we do all day long. And we're very good at it. And we don't stray away from doing these sort of things too much either. I mean, we're pretty clear about what we're good at and why we do these things. So if there's, you know, I don't want to scare people away from trying things. But uh, on the other hand, I think you need to be realistic about what's possible. And the possibility of uh, most people, you know, starting to get into the wholesaling or flipping business like it shows on television, it just life doesn't really work that way. It just doesn't exactly work. In fact, in Los Angeles, where I am, uh, this, the, uh, the saying is that reality TV is anything but. You know, I mean, I don't know how they make those shows, but they're, they're not entirely real. So yeah. it's still television. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you sit and you watch some of those shows and, and there's this camera shot from some tree somewhere of somebody doing something and you're like, OK, wait a minute. How the hell did they get that shot? There had to be a camera there, which meant there wasn't anything real about it to have captured the shot in the first place. But, you know, Joel, one thing you say, and I know that your primary focus is real estate. I, I really do understand that. But I, I would have to say what you just said probably applies in truth to most investments, because the true money that's made, even if it's Wall Street on the stock market or in some form or fashion, is going to be made uh, behind the scenes, putting the deal together and creating something before it ever becomes a retail stock that somebody can go to E-Trade and buy. Unfortunately, listen, I'm not in the stock business, but, you know, unfortunately, you know, we all know this, that, uh, you know, stuff gets cherry picked and then uh, the dregs fall down. And, and I don't know what, uh, you know, retail people buy here and there. I mean, I know in real estate that, uh, you know, I'll pick up that building for 60 cents that I was talking about before, 60 cents on the dollar. And I'll flip it to the guy who was sitting on the airplane for 90 cents. And I'll make more money in five days than he'll make in five years. And that's just how it is. So what's that guy's alternative? What can that guy do instead? How can he actually be in the game? Well, he can recognize that he probably can't beat me at the game because just the nature of how things are. Right. Uh, so it's going to be on my team and we can share the money together. And that's for a lot of guys, you know, it's not, that's not a strategy that works for everybody, but a lot of people will say, you know what, I want to invest in a hedge fund, which is not the same as a REIT. You know, REITs are very controlled. They're regulated. They do things different than, uh, than funds like ours do. But for the right people, you know, that guy could say, you know what, I'd much rather be on a team with people who know what they're doing and take a percentage of the money than try and do it all by myself, which takes a lot of time, a lot of energy, and I probably won't make any more anyway. Okay, so Joel, in the two minutes that we have in this segment, tell me if Chuck wanted to be an investor on your team, what are the requirements that either you have or that the SEC requires in terms of being able to make that happen? Well, actually, this is going to be a great segue into the next uh, part of our discussion anyway, but uh, the government set of uh, rules a long time ago, and I can I can tell the story about where those rules came from. But the government set up rules that, uh, for the most part, we have to deal with people that are called accredited. And accredited investors are people that either make a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, either two hundred or three hundred, depending if they're married or not, or have a net worth of a million dollars or more. Now, a couple hundred thousand on the coast is not all that much money, but a lot of people in the middle of the country. Uh, don't make that kind of money uh, because it just costs less to live. But a lot of those people might own farms, they might own ranches, they might own uh, all kinds of things, so they have a lot of net worth because the, their families have been accumulating things for a long time. So there's about, I think it's about 9 million accredited investors in the United States. Those are people that meet that requirement. Uh, that's only about 3% of the population. And then uh, the other 97%, uh, you know, really are, are somewhat required to go into uh, other kinds of assets, but that's changing. And I, I'm happy to share how that uh, change is coming up uh, when we keep going. All right. You know, one of the things, and I appreciate the, uh, it's an interesting conversation because if only 3% of the country is accredited, uh, that means there's a lot of people out there that are looking for something that they can do that is going to give them uh, at, at least a fighting chance. 
And, and my guess is that's the majority of people who will be listening to this show. This is Chuck Gallagher. This is Straight Talk Radio. We're having a financial discussion with Joel Block. He is the chief deal maker for Bullseye Capital. Bullseye Capital is a hedge fund that deals with uh, uh, distressed properties nationwide. He has 40 syndications throughout his career. Uh, this is the real estate guru if you want to talk about things like this. But we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back and we're going to talk about, but what can we do for the other 97%? This is Chuck Gallagher. Stick with us. So this is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. And the question, the burning question is, what happens to the other 97%? Now, if you if you haven't been tuned into the show the whole time, my guest is Joel Block. He is the chief deal maker with Bullseye Capital. Uh, Joel's involved in the real estate uh, segment of the market, uh, put together the Bullseye Capital Real Property Opportunity Fund, which is a real estate hedge fund that acquires distressed multifamily and commercial assets nationwide. But Joel, we were talking that only 3% of the population of the United States technically is uh, a suitable candidate to invest in your hedge fund. And so that begs the question, what happens to the rest of us, the 97% that say, but but we've got some assets to invest. We just don't happen to meet the requirements that the government has established to say we can play ball with you. Let me, uh, let me give you a little bit of background, a little bit of history uh, on where this all comes from. And I think that understanding this will help people to uh, kind of appreciate it. It may not make them like it anymore, but it'll certainly help them to understand it. Uh, in the in the 1920s, all, you had all these con artists and hoodlums running around town, uh, telling widows and orphans that uh, they had twenty dollars that they would turn it into five hundred dollars, and then they'd be set and life would be great for them. And uh, they would collect all these twenty dollar bills, and then they would run away. Right. And, and and then the stock market crashes in 29, and you got all these people who are destitute. So 1933 and 1934, the government sets up uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the SEC. And basically that uh, agency was set up to monitor uh, all transactions where uh, stock is being sold of a company. And they basically set up rules that said, if you want to sell stock in a company, then you're going to get an audit. You're going to get attorneys involved. That's why these giant accounting firms, that's where they came from to audit all these companies. And that's why you got certain giant legal firms because these giant corporations need all this legal service. And so that's kind of where all these things came from. But the entrepreneurs of the day uh, in the early 30s uh, go to the SEC and they said, listen, this is a terrible idea because if you force all of us to have to have audits and all these other things, you're going to stifle innovation. You're going to slow down the growth in the country and it would just be terrible. And the SEC said, you know what? You're right. So we're going to make an exception. We don't want little people ripped off. You know, we got to protect little people. Uh, but if you're a millionaire or whatever, the, I don't know what the standard was at that time. But if you're a substantial person and you can call your own accountant, you can call your own attorney and you can sustain a loss, then you can invest in anything you want. And the government of the United States will just be hands off. And that's that's what the rules are. And so okay. uh, that's why we have to deal with accredited investors. Now, we can take in a couple non accredited, a small number of them, uh, you know, family members, brothers, sisters, you know, people, you know, that, uh, you know, that. They're, they're, they're pretty good. They may not totally meet the standard, but, you know, they're not, uh, it would be improper and it would be uh, really bad for me to take the last dollar somebody had. And, and I would never, ever do that. That would just be a terrible thing to do. And that's the reason I've never had any uh, regulatory problems or otherwise, because I deal with the right kind of people and, uh, and I know who they are. And, you know, it just, that's just how it works. Sure. Um, and these rules have stayed in place for 80 years. Okay. Until, until 2012, and they made the biggest change to the securities laws uh, in, in 80 years. And those rules are the adoption of the JOBS Act, J-O-B-S, Jumpstart Our Business Startups, in 2012. And what that basically did is, you know, on the heels of this terrible recession, the president, uh, you know, and the Congress wisely said, you know, uh, we have to do things that are going to help little companies have access to more capital. we got to figure out ways... And so they came up with these rules uh, and they're controversial rules and they're still not all implemented. But basically what the rules uh, say is that little businesses can now crowdfund. And here's what crowdfunding is. I'm not talking about Kickstarter and you want to make a movie on Kickstarter. Uh, you know, somebody wants to make a movie about dogs so they find all the people who like dogs 
And they say, if you put in $20, then I'll have the money to make the movie. And then when the movie's made, I'll give you a copy of the movie. That's called to make a donation. And I'll give you a reward, donation or reward. Okay. Um, and so, you know, but, you know, then that's, but that's not equity. That's just a donation. And there have been a couple situations in the last, uh, well, actually, it's happening almost every week now. But about a year, a year and a half ago, uh, this company comes out called Oculus. And Oculus uh, makes these uh, video goggles, these uh, right. virtual reality type goggles. And they said, if you uh, want a pair of these, we haven't invented them yet, but we're gunning them. Uh, give us $250, and when they're made, uh, we'll send you a pair. So they uh, they collected about $250 from like 10,000 people, I think a couple million dollars. And then some venture capital company calls them and says, gee, this is incredible. What what are you doing? Oh, well, uh, we uh, we just crowdfunded $2.5 million. And they go, wow, we'd like to throw a little money in the pot. And they put in $15 million. So they're doing whatever they're supposed to be doing. And then they sometime later get a call from Facebook. And Facebook says, what are you all doing? Well, we did this crowdfunding campaign. It went great. And then we got a venture capital company. It's going great. And Facebook says, you know what? We'd like to buy this company. And they gave them $2 billion. $2 billion. And the uh, people that made the donations were pretty unhappy about this. Because, number one, they didn't participate in any of the $2 billion. And so, you know, each each two fifty dollars would have been about $40,000, by the way. Right. But secondarily, because they, they, the thought was, listen, crowdfunding is like, we're supporting your effort. We're part of your community. We didn't give you the money to monetize it and make you a billionaire. You know, we gave it to you for a different reason. And this is happening now every week where companies that went on Kickstarter or Indiegogo or one of these other kind of sites are, you know, turning their, their ideas into, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. And people are a little bit tired of this. You know, they're, they're a little bit unhappy. I'm, wait, I'm donating and you're getting all the money. There's something wrong with that. It's not, it doesn't appeal to the fairness that we all understand that we all learned in kindergarten. You know, we all have a certain sense of fairness that we learned when we were five years sure, old. Sure. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so concurrently, but coincidentally, the Congress and the president in 2012 come up with these new rules. And they basically say, listen, for little companies, they're for little, for little capital races, you don't have to go through all the trouble uh, like the SEC set up. Uh, we'll set up something where you can crowdfund and sell stock at the same time so you can sell stock to the crowd now that's not totally legal yet you can't do it it's it's actually in process but imagine the impact uh, you're a dry cleaner you need to get to all new equipment uh, you're not going to sell stock in your company but you might borrow money you might say listen I, I'll, I'll pay 12 percent I need a hundred grand and, a, and you know a hundred people each put in a thousand and listen so if you're uh, if you're somebody who uh, you know you got to keep most of your money in a place like the stock market, which is safe, and maybe in a, in a mutual fund or somewhere, whatever your financial advisor tells you to do. If you want to keep it safe, but you might take some small percentage of your money and put it into things that uh, yield a little bit more money. So maybe a 12% loan uh, to a dry cleaner, maybe a, you know a 10% uh, investment in this, or you know whatever you know. So there are going to be opportunities that are on the horizon in the crowdfunding environment that are very exciting. They're, they're not guarantees. Uh, you know, and you don't want to put your life savings in these things. You got to be very careful. But, uh, you know, opportunities that don't exist for a non-accredited people, which is almost all Americans, by the way, as, as you already noted. Right. Uh, they're they're on the way. They're on the way for sure. And and so just be a little patient. You know, one of the things that um, we, just, we just have to be a little patient and it's going to work out. So, so fundamentally, as we as we start to wrap up the show, uh, it's been a, it's it's a fascinating discussion because everyone fundamentally wants to make sure that their money is working for them, and and quite frankly, you know this, most Americans uh, don't have their money working for them. In fact, the uh, the generation that I'm in, the baby boom generation excluding what might be inherited from the generation that's ahead of us, excluding that, are woefully unprepared for retirement because we have not done the work that we need to do in terms of investing our money. So uh, let me say this, I guess, as, as part of our close, obviously the crowdfunding is something that's on the horizon. That's Kickstarter might be the internet approach to, I, I'll make a donation, so to speak, but there is something that's coming out there. And likewise, uh, I'm also hearing that there are probably a fair number of people that will be listening to our show that might decide, you know what, I don't want to have to get out and hammer nails on a weekend and paint stuff to try to flip the house when I could 
invest my funds with Bullseye Capital Real Property Opportunity Fund and know that I'm going to get 60% of the profit of what you do and you are working off of my capital to create that profit uh, for you. My guest has been Joel Block. You can find out about Bullseye Capital at bullseyecap.com, bullseyecap.com. Uh, he's out in California. So, Joel, it's it's been an honor and pleasure to have you uh, as one of um, uh, my NSA friends. I know that you do um, uh, some wonderful work whenever you have your your uh, symposiums and the people come in and you do the training work that you do. So we appreciate the training side of it, but also the uh, the other perspective that you bring to the table. Thank you so much. Hey, man. Well, listen, thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. I, I hope that people are benefited by, you know, understanding uh, – a little bit of straight talk about how the money business works. Well, uh, you know what? We'll actually get you on again because I like having straight talk about money. That's a wonderful thing. This is Chuck Gallagher. Remember, every choice you make in life has a consequence. And so I wish you and hope that you'll consider all the choices that you make and know that those choices can create the success that you want. This is Chuck Gallagher with Straight Talk Radio. Join us next week. You've been listening to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. Tune in each week on TransformationTalkRadio.com each Monday at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 p.m. Eastern as Chuck Gallagher, international speaker and author, cuts through the noise to share truth through transparency. Nationally known guests talk about what's important to you, your life, your concerns, and your success. Visit ChuckGallagher.com for more information and turn on to Straight Talk with Chuck Gallagher. 